Day Sellers, it's Suzanne A. Wells, and this is episode number 34 of eBay the Right Way. Today's guest is Savannah Boone, who lives in Tennessee and has an interesting and unusual full time job. She is a part time eBay seller, and I've been watching her business progress over the years as she posts on the Money Making Mondays threads. And Savannah was so much fun to talk to. So let's get into the interview. Okay, we are with Savannah Boone today, and she's going to shed some light on her eBay business and how that's evolved. Say hi to everybody. Hey, guys. And you are located where? I'm in Shelbyville, Tennessee, which is about 50 miles south of Nashville. Okay. And as we always start off with, how did you get started on eBay? Well, I first opened my eBay account way back in 2010. I was a teenager and I initially sold like a couple of DVDs on there and I maybe sold them for like two bucks. <laughs> and that was that was it. And in 2019, um, my boss here at the funeral home, I'm a mortician, his aunt passed away and she was 96. And of course, in 96 years, you accumulate a lot of stuff. And her family had gone through the house and picked out what they wanted. And he said, hey, we have a ton of stuff left over. If you want to come by and look at it and just take whatever you want, feel free to grab anything. Because if not, we're either going to take it to the dump or Goodwill. Mm -hmm. So I picked through things and there was like silver plated silverware and um, she had a dresser vanity set. And I mean, just vintage leather gloves and handbags, just all sorts of stuff. She was a really neat lady. She was retired from um, the Secret Service. Oh. And she, she had traveled like all over the world. And she was a very sophisticated, neat little lady and she had great stuff. And I just like loaded up my truck and I took it all home and I didn't know what I was gonna do with it. And I thought, well, why don't I sell some on eBay? I know some of this has got to be worth a pretty penny. And I thought, I don't really know where to start. So I went on YouTube and I, I found you. And <laughs> about your videos is that you're really realistic and to the point and you're not trying to, not really trying to create a massive empire and, and all that stuff. You were just really to the point and I resonated with you better than anyone else on YouTube. So oh, thank you. I've just, I've stuck with you and I've, I really liked your methods. So, and I've been implementing them and they've been working. So that's initially how I got started was that I just basically had all this free stuff dumped in my lab and I just started researching and learning as I went and it's turned out pretty good so far. Okay, we're gonna talk about some of the things I've seen you post. But let's, let's go back to your, is it a full-time job? Yes. I, I, my little phrase is I say I'm a part-time eBay seller, but a full-time mortician. So what exactly do you do at the funeral home? What is your position? I do a little bit of everything. I, I go on death calls and pick up bodies. I make arrangements with families. I organize the funerals, do the music, slideshow, the little memorial records with their picture on the front. Mm -hmm. I literally do everything, so. And is this a family business? No, um, the funeral home I work with is a small family-owned funeral home, but I'm not related to them. I'm the first generation in my family to do that. But um, the funeral home I work for, I love it because it's small mom and pop. It's very family oriented. And my boss is very accommodating to me. I joke that I'm his fifth child. They have four kids and I'm, I'm the fifth child is what I always say. Well, I have to ask, how in the world did you end up in this job? 
I get that question all the time. I mean, because you would think if it's a family yeah. business, you've been around it your whole life and it's just, you're used to it. But for somebody who is is not part of that family, because around me, most of the funeral homes are family run. It's a family yeah. business. So yeah. I'm just curious how, how you got involved. Well, when I was little, my grandfather was very into genealogy. And as a kid, he would drag me around to all of these little country cemeteries trying to find our dead relatives. <laughs> and, and he would say, OK, we're looking for so and so. And we would split up. And so I would go from every headstone looking for a certain person. And as a little kid, I was just curious on, you know, what did that person look like after being buried for so many years? And I would calculate through the dates and the math and figure up how old each person was when they passed. And that initially kind of sparked my interest as a kid. And later on in high school, you know how the guidance counselors, they're all encouraging you and pushing you. You've got to figure out your whole life right now mm -hmm. and what you want to do. And it was so stressful. And that previous summer, I had two friends that had passed away. And I remember when I went to their funerals, I thought, oh my gosh, they look like crap. I could do a better job than that. Mm -hmm. And when the guidance counselor was really harping on that, that popped into my mind. And I knew I wanted to do something that was different, that wasn't a typical nine to five job, something where I could live anywhere in the country and do my job. I mean, if you're a deep sea fisherman, you have to live on the coast. Mm -hmm. Good thing about a funeral home is they're everywhere and they're always necessary no matter what the economy looks like if there's a pandemic or not a pandemic they're always essential so I after high school I thought well I'll go to mortuary school and if I don't like it I'll just figure something out and I, I went to mortuary school and on the first day of orientation I said, can I please watch an embalming? So that way I know whether I can handle this or not, because I don't want to get six months into school and have all this tuition tied up and then be like, you know what, this isn't for me. So right, right. I actually went to, after orientation, they said, sure. And we went to a funeral home and I watched my first embalming. And the funny thing is at my, my mortuary school, I actually have, a, I'm kind of like a, I have a funny story connected to me. So I was nervous that morning before I went to school and I didn't eat. And while I was watching the embalming, I passed out. <laughs> and it's not because I was grossed out. It was because my blood sugar was low. Right, and was right. Getting hot. And I was just standing there. And then all of a sudden I started seeing little black dots and I woke up and um, two of the embalmers were standing over me like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. What are y'all doing hovering over me? And they're like, you passed out. And so that's kind of the running joke at the mortuary school. They're like, oh, the person who passed out the first time they watched an embalming and they thought I would never be back. And they were shocked when I kept coming back. And I was like, uh -huh. no, I can handle it. So, oh, so that was just a weird coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, well, you have a very sweet and caring energy, I can tell from just talking with you for a few minutes. And that's really essential to the business you're in because um, I have some stuff in my history. There was a suicide in my family. There was a very violent murder in my family where my stepfather was uh, actually shot in the face with a sawed off shotgun just oh, no. out, of, out of nowhere um that's a long story it was a gang initiation but anyway that was gosh like 25 years ago but those were two very violent horrible things and um I remember at the funeral home how kind and caring the people were because you have you have to be like that to help these families. So I commend you for doing that business. And it seems like you're in the right place for your um, your empathy and your temperament. Because it must take a lot of patience dealing with horrible deaths and grieving families and all the stuff you have to do. So does that wear on you very much? 
Yes, it can be very stressful at times because we we joke at the funeral home, we get more families that come in fighting than hugging. So Oh, we, I bet you do. <laughs> yes. So we have to kind of just compartmentalize it and um, de-stress after work and and thrifting is very therapeutic for me and it's a it's a good distraction. It, it, the business has its ups and downs. There's times where um, we may have like 10 people at one time or uh -huh. we may have just one or two people. So it's it's very unpredictable. We never know how much work we're going to have and I joke that around holidays and weekends is when things typically pick up. So mm. like the emergency room, you know, yes. <laughs> I mean, my, my mom worked in an emergency room for a while and, and that's definitely a true thing where holidays, you know, people are drinking and trying to cook and the knives and they have mm -hmm. accidents or they get in arguments with family they don't normally see and just they're just not on top of their game because everything is different and there's more people in the house and yeah. driving to and from and all that kind of stuff. So um, going back to where you said uh, the makeup, doing makeup for, mm -hmm. I don't know, what do you call them? Your clients, <laughs> yeah. uh, your customers. Anyway, um, back to my, my stepfather. I mean, his, his face was just unrecognizable. And they, they put him back together and I did go in and the family went in to say goodbye to the open casket. And I was shocked at how good they made him look. And that is just such a wonderful service and gift that you can give a grieving family to mm -hmm. allow them to see their loved one one last time in a peaceful situation if it was a violent and unexpected death because it does give you some closure to see them peaceful and put back together. <laughs> oh yeah, one of the most rewarding things about this job is when people come up afterwards and say, thank you so much. You made mom look like she did before she got sick. And just being able to give people some closure, it makes you feel better. It makes up for the late nights and the bickering and arguing you see and people throwing in pictures of the slideshow in the last minute that thank you at the end of the day really it makes it all worth it well if your customers don't tell you I'll tell you that your work is is really appreciated and you just don't know how far that goes maybe it only takes you an hour to do it but it there's a huge impact when you can get some closure and see your loved one at peace when it, it wasn't like that, you know, before they passed. So yeah. anyway, that's all the heavy stuff. Let's get into the yeah. fun stuff. now. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've never chatted with someone who works at a funeral home. So this was interesting for me um, to see what you do on your off time, but I can definitely see that eBay provides a welcome and fun distraction from your heavy and serious day job, or I guess night job, whenever you do it. What are you, nine to five? Yeah, well, I'm typically Monday through Friday, eight to four. And then on the weekends, I'm on call every other weekend. So on my weekends, I'm off. I make the most of it. I'm telling my husband, I'm like, let's go ride the four wheelers. Let's go <laughs> camping. It's like, let's get away. Right. Do you have kids? Nope, no kids. Okay, so it's you and your husband, and is mm -hmm. he on board with the eBay work? Yes, he, I, I love that he brags on me to everybody. He brags on me to his co-workers. He's like, you know, your wife goes shopping and spends money on boutique kids' clothes, and he's like, my wife's hobby is making money. <laughs> her hobby makes her money instead of spends money everywhere. So I, know, so I find that all the time as an eBay seller, I have some, my good friend that is a University of Georgia graduate, and mm -hmm. she is very into tailgating with all of her UGA friends, and that's what she does in the fall is they're, they're doing the, going to the game, even if they don't go to the game, they go up to Athens to tailgate, and just, she has such a, a big time, and I thought, um, that's her scene you know everybody has their scene of what they enjoy and it's like I just like 
making money <laughs> so that when things come up that I want to do, if I want to go on a random beach trip or do something, then I've, I've already done the work. But I think about that all the time is, am, am I missing out because I'm not going to this or that or you know, the Braves are going to the World Series. We just found that out yesterday and all these people trying to get tickets to the game. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. I just, I'll just watch it on TV and listen and <laughs> and list my stuff and make money. There <laughs> you go. Good it's a plan. Mind- Sounds like a good plan to me. It's a mindset. So you're definitely on board with that. So do you remember the first item you ever sold? It was a DVD of some sort. Oh, right. And, you did say that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And it was, I think I maybe sold it for two bucks. And at the time I had free shipping and I went to the post office and I think to ship it was like three bucks. And I'm like, well, crap, I didn't make any money. So that's why I didn't dabble in eBay till like 10 years later. Cause I was like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I want to do this right and actually make money. So when did you start seriously doing it? Um, May of 2019. So I've got a little little over two years. So I'm still wet behind the ears. Well, no, not really, because you show up on that hundred dollar thread all the time. And what I remember is a lot of seasonal items. Mm -hmm. I love selling Christmas and Halloween type stuff. Um, I have clothing in my store, but I'm honestly trying to phase that out. It's not, I'm not enjoying it anymore. And it's just hard, becoming harder and harder to find good quality items in my area. Mm-hmm. And I just have much better luck finding collectibles and seasonal and knickknack type stuff. I just have a plethora of that. And I, I, my mindset is use whatever sources you have to your advantage. If your local Goodwill has a plethora of like plush, for instance, Start looking in the plush. If that's something you would be interested in, go to that area where your store thrives in and, you know, start looking and seeing what you can find. Use yeah, use what's available to you. Uh-huh, exactly. As I do hear this all the time. People say, oh, I want to get into clothing, but my thrift store just doesn't have a lot of clothing. They have more sporty goods or yeah. farm stuff or whatever it is. And it's like, you have to work with what's available to you because everybody's stores are different and I don't you do estate sales too I do so in my area a lot of the state estate sales have started doing online even before COVID but COVID really just launched that even more so I I visit a website called highbid.com and it's spelled h-i-b-i-d And you can search by zip code. And I find of a lot of estate sales in my area. And I just look for the quirky stuff. It's kind of weird because a lot of the things that you would sit there and think to yourself, that's junk. People will bid on like crazy. But the stuff, like the little hidden gems, they'll go for dirt cheap. Like just last week, um, I found two sets of Gloria Vanderbilt wine glasses And I didn't even know Gloria Vanderbilt had wine glasses or any type of glassware. And I'll go through there and I'll hit watch in the auctions on stuff I really like. So I hit watch and I went to eBay and there was no current items listed. But in the solds, I seen that like a set of five sold for around $150. And I got both sets. I paid $4 for one set and $2 for the other and I've got them currently listed. And right now I'm the only one who has any listed. So hopefully I'm crossing my fingers. They'll sell pretty soon. But if I can spend $6 and make anywhere from $250 to $300 off a set of glasses, I will be perfectly fine with that. Absolutely. So on this site, high bid, how does the shipping work? Well, I do. I only do locals. I've never done any of the shipping, so I just oh. go to my local area. But they do have a shipping option, but I'm not sure how much that runs. I haven't, like I said, I've only stick to the little local ones where I can pick it up. In okay, person. yeah, that makes perfect sense. Okay, now this might not have been you, but 
Did you sell the Cracker Barrel, was it dog, the dog yes. and pumpkin thing? It was that might have been last year. Yes, that was awesome. So that was actual. That came from a, a state sale, but that one was actually an in person estate sale. So um, th that particular estate sale we had buried the couple that had passed away and the family said, Hey, we're having an estate sale. And they let me know what the dates were. So I just, Oh, I just thought what a connection. Yeah. Yes. You find out about that. Oh, I that, that is a good connection. It is. <laughs> so at that estate sale, I went and they had everything like all spread out in the garden. It was an auction style estate sale. That was, they did it through their, the real estate company, but you know, my husband said, well, I want to go with you this time. I've never got to like really see you in action. So I would walk around, I'd, I'd have my phone and I'd be looking at stuff. And Cracker Barrel stuff in general is pretty pricey to begin with. But um, I seen these two dogs and they were really tall and they were still in the original boxes. So I was like, well, I'll let me look this up. And I turned to my husband and I was like, babe, guess how much this is worth? And I showed him and he was like, holy moly. And I was crossing my fingers and I was like, Lord, please don't let anyone else bid on these. And they didn't. And there was two of them. There was, there were both Labradors, but there was one that was dressed as a ghost and the other as a witch. And I got both of them for five bucks. And I sold one for 150 and the other for a hundred. Yeah, those were great. I made a mental note of those because I don't know how it is in other parts of the country, but Cracker Barrel is quite the thing in the South. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Like every other exit, there's a Cracker Barrel and Absolutely. their store has all this interesting stuff in it. And the restaurant itself has all this cool and unique stuff on the walls. And <laughs> I'll even see stuff when I'm out and think, yeah, somebody is going to buy that to hang on the mm -hmm. wall at Cracker Barrel <laughs> or, you know, a barbecue restaurant that is kind of that same theme. We have a lot of those, too, where it's just all this weird stuff on the wall, like tools and hubcaps and, you know, mm -hmm. saddles and stirrups and just all this um, old rusty metal stuff. Yep. <laughs> it, it's did the core. Know, did you know that they specifically have a picker cracker barrel has a person that specifically that's what they do it yeah I, I do I, I I had heard that um yeah they're out there looking for this interesting decor memorabilia old crappy rusty license plates just all kinds of stuff and I don't normally eat in the cracker barrel because mm -hmm. it's very uncomfortable <laughs> Their chairs are so, they're wooden and they're hard and there's no padding and it's not, a, there's no booths. It's mm -hmm. not a comfortable place to eat. And that's by design because it's for travelers who yep. they don't want them sitting there forever, getting comfortable, having four cups of coffee after their dinner. They want them out of there so they can turn that table. So <laughs> in, in days gone by, when we did travel, we lived in other States and would come back to Atlanta to visit family and stuff. Um, we did you know, stop at Cracker Barrel. And it was just, that's when I was observing all this old stuff. And a lot of restaurants do that around here, whether it's barbecue or just the, you know, Southern style home cooking, that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, but the, uh, I didn't know they made those, I guess, porch decorations because those, that dog, it was like a Labrador with a a witch costume on and he was holding a pumpkin bucket for candy. Yep. How big was that? Um, I think it was around 24 inches, both of them were. So it was pretty big. But yes, so it's like a porch, a porch decoration or something put in the yard. But like I said, it had the original box. So it was packed nice and tightly with styrofoam. So I essentially just left it in the box as it was. And then I wrapped the box itself in bubble wrap and placed it in another box. Mm -hmm. And the lady who bought the uh, ghost one, she left a, just a great review. And she also sent me a message. She was going to gift it to one of her friends. And she was just so thrilled to find it. And that made me feel really good. Yeah, and I just was like, wow, that's interesting. I didn't know their stuff was so valuable. So any kind of 
decor, holiday decoration, memorabilia type stuff that they would sell in their Cracker Barrel store mm -hmm. is worth looking up. Oh, yeah. Like Pier One, people think that stuff is just crap and it's not worth anything, but oh no, some of it is. Oh, it is. And I find a lot of Pier One at my Goodwill. Like I'll find plates and mugs and stuff, and those usually are worth a pretty penny. They're worth pretty good. So I always try to pick those up if I find them priced pretty reasonable. And it's that bottom line of, you know, what is it? You got to look it up, see what it is. Not every single Pier One thing is going to be worth money but the older stuff or if it matches a set to a certain pattern that kind of stuff that people are looking to replace um because pier one back in the day was you're too young to really know but <laughs> that was a joke store at the mall it was like oh pier one that's just junk for your house it's it wasn't like pottery barn or crate and barrel where it had this high quality reputation it was just kind of a junky store to buy candles and crap for your house. <laughs> yeah. So here we are all these years later. Um, I got married in 1988 and my sister and I had this joke about, you know, we're, we're decorating our homes with Pier One stuff because that's all we could afford, <laughs> you know, young and married 30 something years ago. And now the tables have turned and it's worth money. <laughs> yep. So what is your process when you go in the thrift store? Do you have a specific way you shop? Um, well, my method is if it looks interesting and grabs my attention, I just immediately stick it in my buggy. And then like you have mentioned before in your videos, I'll go to like a quiet part of the store and look things up just individually. Um, I typically hit like the mugs, plates. I like the belts and the plush and hats typically. So I very rarely glance at clothing, not unless something just grabs my eye as I'm just swooping through there. Um, there's, there's a few, there's a handful of eBay sellers who frequent my store. So, and they, they tend to emphasize on clothing. So I, I'm just like, y'all have at it. And, and the bras too, nobody touches the bras. And I love it because I don't, I don't know if it's like this in your area, but a lot of people in my area have made comments like, oh, I would never buy a bra from Goodwill. That's dirty, that's nasty. And, and this, and that. they like frown upon it. So it's like the shunned section of the store. So <laughs> I buy bras all the time and I'm like, yeah, y'all keep thinking that. So just stay away. Right. So, you know, there are other resellers shopping in there. And so uh -huh. you're, you're kind of working around what, what they're doing, which is what you have to do. You have okay. to, I mean, there is enough to go around for everybody. I truly mm -hmm. believe that because the minute I leave, they could bring out a cart of whatever. And that time I found three Hermes ties in this giant tie bin because I looked through all of them. It took me almost half an hour, yeah. but that was, the, that was the reward. But how, how long had that been there? They had been there a few weeks and wow. nobody took the time to look through that big jumble of ties, but there's always something else you can look for. Mm -hmm. You have to learn to work around other people and not get discouraged that um, other people are taking all your stuff. Yeah. Because as a new eBay seller, a lot of people feel that way. And I did when I first started, I thought I, I gotta get up there and get this stuff. And I didn't want anybody knowing what I was doing because they're going to copy me and they're going to, they're going to raid my stores and there won't be anything for me. And that was the beginner attitude. Once you get into it and realize how much work it is, most people are not going to do it. Mm -mm. You really don't have to be threatened. I do see certain booksellers, I run into them, you know, oh, there's that guy, he's always looking at the books, you know, he's not going to look at the bras. No. He's not going to look for vintage underpants. No, not at all. <laughs> but I hear what you're saying about the bras. It's, it's in the same category as used underwear. People are yeah, like, Ooh, gross. I'm not going to do that, but um, you can look at my store too, my sales. 
I sell bras sometimes for over $50 and they get donated new with the tag. And these are 85 to hundred dollar bras, Soma and Victoria's Secret and some of the other brands that you start seeing the same ones over and over again. You don't have to think, you know, oh, there's that, there's that, there's that style. I've sold that 25 times and they are, they're just so easy, but mm -hmm. that is a product that I want to say not to be sexist, but a lot of men are not going to do that because it's not familiar. They don't, they haven't been wearing it their whole life and they don't know anything about it. Um, just like I probably would never sell hunting stuff because that's just not something I ever do. I, I don't know anything about it, but, and then there's the embarrassment factor of touching them and looking through them. Mm -hmm. Even some women don't you know, that's not their comfort zone. They don't want to do yeah. that or checking out and you've got eight bras in your cart and you're handing them to a young teenage boy cashier. <laughs> sometimes they get a little embarrassed. I could see their face turn red and sometimes they don't care, but um, yeah. yeah, that is overlooked. You're right. And the other day, cause I, I try to lean towards like the bigger sizes. So I, yesterday I found two bras that were 44 G and they were brand new with tag. That's a big bra. And it was kind of funny because the cashier looked at the bras and they looked at me, which I'm <laughs> obviously not that size, you know, and she didn't say <laughs> kind of funny. It's like, ah, is she going to use this for a gag gift or costume? I'm going to use that for a planter. I'm going to hang that in yeah. a macrame planter. And <laughs> you know, what yep. brand were they? Do you remember? They were Torrid brand. Right. Yeah, that's a plus size store. Mm -hmm. I think it's Kashyyyk and Torrid. Yes. Um, the biggest size I ever sold was a 44J. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and, you know, I always say, oh, bras are small and easy to ship and don't take up much room. Well, not all of them. <laughs> Some are kind of big, but you know, it's for that specific customer. And I can imagine those bigger sizes are just hard to find. Absolutely. And you yeah. can go, you can go online and check, and this is in my bra course, but um, you can see when you're pricing it, go, go online and look at major retailers and mm -hmm. is it in stock? And they have that little chart where you click on the, the band size and then the cup size. And a lot of the combinations are out of stock. Mm -hmm. especially now with all these supply chain issues and stores that just don't have the inventory. So it's like unlimited possibilities with the combination of the band size, the cup size, the color, the brand, the style, all that kind of stuff. So a lot of opportunities there. Oh yeah. So good and, for you. <laughs> and to get back to how I like to shop the method, I like to go to the bins that they just freshly roll out because I find the best stuff in there. Um, Friday, two days ago, I found a Department 56 Cousin Eddie's RV from Christmas Vacation. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. And I was so excited, one, because I love that movie, but two, it was only six bucks. And when I looked it up, that, that typically sells for $93. And if you can find any of the Christmas Vacation Department 56, any of them, pick them up because they sell really high. And so very, let me back up. What year were you born? 1992. Okay, so you're a couple of years older than my daughter. So, yep. and you know those vacation movies. That's, that's good. It. Those are 80s movies. <laughs> Oh yeah, my mom, my mom just, she would record stuff on VHS and I grew up watching that and the Goonies and, oh, 16. Okay, so your mom everything. is my generation, Gen X. Yep. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's what I did to my kids. I forced them to watch all my favorite movies and TV yep. shows. And now at first they, they had to be old enough to understand the humor. Yeah. So now things like, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Airplane, Caddyshack, Overboard, all those movies where us 80s teenagers know all the lines. Uh, Home Alone. Yes. Um, they love all those movies and they get the humor. So... <laughs>
I'm glad to see here's other Gen Xers like me brainwashing their children at a young age. Like, let's turn off Barney and put on Christmas vacation. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. So what is your highest sale ever? Well, my highest sale, it's not very impressive. It's only 270 bucks. And I know from listening to the other podcast, you know, people are like, oh, I sold something for 800 or 1,000. So I'm working really hard to beat that goal. But that item was something I bought at an online estate sale. And it was a Flamingo mid-century modern TV lamp. And it was pretty big size. And um I, I received, I had it listed for 300 and the lady sent me an offer for 270 and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go for it. So I bought it for $47. So that wasn't a bad flip. No, that's great. Yes. And the lady who bought it, she was so ecstatic when it arrived because she said she had previously bought the same lamp off of eBay, but when it arrived, it was broken. And, um, I wrapped that thing. It looked like this humongous bubble wrap ball. I mean, I feel like I could have threw it off the roof of my house and it would have been okay. I was, because I was just like, Lord, please don't let this break. This is the most expensive thing I have sold. And it got there, it got there perfectly fine. And I was so relieved. But another story I'd like to share with you is of my second highest sale. And it's also kind of a, it was a big learning moment for me. So I went to um, the Good Samaritan store here in town. I don't really frequent it often because they typically just have clothes. And when I went, I found this vintage Abercrombie and Fitch quilt work patch looking jacket. And I paid five bucks for it and I got it home and I photographed it and I was researching on eBay and I couldn't find any solds on it. and. I had um, Googled the label to, and I found out it was from the 1960s. Ooh. But I couldn't, I couldn't find, like I said, I couldn't find any information on eBay. So I was like, I'm just going to list this high. And it sold for full asking price, $250 in 20 minutes. And then afterwards, I had about half a dozen people messaging me. They were like, if your buyer doesn't end up paying, if they cancel the order, I will pay you $500 for it. And, this, and my husband was like, did you Google it? And I said, no, I, well, I Googled the label, but I didn't Google the jacket itself. So when I Googled it, I found on this independent website, it wasn't worth point. It was something else, but someone else had that jacket listed for $1,600. <laughs> Yes. Oh no. And I was like, oh no, I really underpriced it. But I mean, now looking back at it, I'm like, well, I turned five bucks into 250 in less than 20 minutes. So, I mean, I was grateful for that, but my lesson from that was, okay, if I can't find it on eBay or any of the solds, always Google it. So I learned right. my lesson. So I call that my biggest flop. Well, the, everybody has those stories. Don't oh, yeah. beat yourself up about it. And you're right. Go to Google because it could be on Etsy. It could yeah. be on somebody's blog where they're talking about it. You go to Google Images and, and that'll lead you places. So it could be on Poshmark. It could be on Mercari. I find things like that all the time that there's just not enough on eBay to get any information. So, yeah. um, but if you have an abundance mindset, you're like, okay, that was a learning curve mm -hmm. or where that came from. There's a million more things that I could find in the next week. Um, who knows what's going to, what's being donated right now that you're going to find the next time you go. Yep. So it's, you know, that's the way I look at the world. It's just, there's so many, there's more opportunities than time to find everything and it's just, mm -hmm. it's just this constant flow that's never going to stop and I did an experiment one, once um, I moved to a new part of town and so I went to this one Goodwill that's two miles from where I live I went every day just to see what I could see that was different mm -hmm. and I personally like going to different stores all the time just because I gotta stay motivated and I get bored really easily <laughs> 
not in not in an ADD kind of way. Just like there's so much around me, why not go different places? But yeah. yeah, every time I went, there was different things. So it's just every everything's growing all the time, and and you can't be everywhere at the same time. So Absolutely. and don't worry about other sellers being there because I guarantee they're not looking for what you're looking for. How many people might have seen, well, like that Cracker Barrel decoration? There were other people at that sale. They had no interest in it. And nope. it was perfect for you. Mm -hmm. I really like to hit yard sales too. I, I would say about 50% of my inventory has come from either yard sales or estate sales and the other half from the thrift store. And I just absolutely love yard sales because People don't want to drag all that crap back in their house. So what I typically do when I go to a yard sale and I see stuff I like, I tell them, I'm going to make a pile right here. And so I just start piling stuff up in one little area. And, you know, when we get ready to check out, most of the time they're like, I'll have 30 items. And they're like, I had just 20 bucks. So that's how I end up getting a lot of things for a dollar or less. It's just to make a pile. That's what I recommend for yard sales. Well, and sometimes you run into a person that they just don't want to do any math. They're just yeah. like, they don't want to add up all these 25 things that you've put there. Yep. They got, you got people behind you. There's people asking questions. There's all this activity going on. They're like, ah, uh, just, you know, 20 bucks. And they don't want to go through the time to add up each individual item because their mission is to get rid of it. Yep. So. It's, it's fun to find those types of people having yard sales. It's just like, and then they'll say, okay, for the next 30 minutes, everything's a dollar. You know, they just, <laughs> or fill up this bag for $5. And I've been that person before moving years ago with kids. And it's just, I had this giant yard sale. I think I made $800 that day. Just stuff I didn't want to pack up and take with me. Just things kids had outgrown. You have two of everything in your kitchen you don't want to pack all that and move it. So Absolutely. You're smart about that. Now, do y'all have the Goodwill bins or is it just the regular stores? We have the regular store and the closest Goodwill bins is in Nashville. And, and like I said, that's 50 miles away. So it's not very convenient for me to go. And usually when I take vacation time from work, I'll use one of those days to go up there. But I kind of have like a love hate with that because yes, you do find things and it's a dirt cheap price, but I literally get physically exhausted digging through those bins and there's a lot of people and it's very time consuming. Um, I've only been about three times, but every time I leave, I'm sweating and I'm tired, I'm hungry and <laughs> I've usually been there for about five or six hours, but um, you can find some really good stuff there. I feel like my Goodwill bins that's closest to me, it's probably better for clothing pickers more than just household stuff because the household stuff really looks like it gets tossed around very heavily and beat up. So, and people are weirdly competitive at that Goodwill bins about shoes. I mean, and they're really not the greatest quality shoes, but um, people will literally like swarm that humongous bin and like elbow each other. And I'm like, no, thank you. I'm fine. Well, I know one thing that's going on with the shoes where I live, and this has been a thing for probably 10 years that I've known about it. I used to go to a, a thrift store that had uh, like everything was $2 on Friday. And then throughout the week, it would drop. So Saturdays, it was a dollar 75 Sundays it was dollar 50 so Fridays was the day that they had the most inventory and the most people were there and there were these shoe people that um they would they're working in teams and they're they're grabbing stuff and throwing it across to the other person and it was this spectacle like what is going on here what 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 are they doing and they were all sneakers and they weren't great they were just sneakers mm -hmm. and they all the the people doing this were um mexicans 
<laughs> like they were from Mexico. <laughs> we have we have a lot of that here in Atlanta. So, um, but what I found out they were doing is they were buying all these to send back home to Mexico. Oh, oh that's or, interesting. Yeah, for their families. Um, I don't know if they were selling them or or shipping them in bulk or whatever, but they would buy just cartloads of sneakers and they didn't care about the size. They didn't care about the brand. So huh. I would just work around them and, you know, they would leave the expensive stuff like the Merrill's and the Birkenstocks. And so I knew they weren't picking, they, they were yeah. doing something else. So um, that was very interesting. And, and I know that also goes on for people from Africa. They've, different parts of Atlanta, I've seen that too, where uh, they're speaking an, an African language and they're doing this with the shoes. So they're going, they're shipping them back home or they have something else they're doing with them. So that's one of those things where you just learn to work around them. And yeah. I would wait till noon to go to that store because they were always in there the minute it opened and they would do their thing and they would be gone by lunchtime. I was actually in there one time when the police had to be called because these guys pulled out a gun and that's how serious they were about getting their sneakers. So I definitely stayed away from that. And it, it wasn't in a part of town that was considered dangerous. It was in a nicer part of town with the nice neighborhoods nearby. And so that was, that was really strange, but those, people would also come up to this part of town um, in car loads. You know, they, they came out of the way on purpose to come to this specific store where they could get all these shoes for $2 a pair. So, you know, you work around and senior day, now that I can do that, um, <laughs> I don't go till afternoon because all the seniors are there early and... <laughs> <laughs> they're gone by 11 <laughs> to eat lunch and go home. So um, my, my daughter calls it the silver flood. <laughs> oh, <I love> that. <laughs> like, don't go during the morning during the silver flood. You need to go in the afternoon. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm part of that. <laughs> but um, yeah, so you just have to work around what other people are doing, but there's always opportunities. I'm sure you've seen your business evolve during this short time that you've been doing it. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm very fortunate. Um, when I started in May of 2019, I'm all about keeping up with my numbers and knowing Yay! what I'm doing. <laughs> so, so from May of 2019 to the end of that year, um, after profit, I made $4,000. And I was so thrilled. And then in 2020, I had, um, I purchased $600 worth of inventory and my profit after fees and stuff was eight thousand dollars excellent good for you so, yeah so I, unfortunately this year I don't think I'll be able to hit the eight thousand dollar mark because between July and September I had to step away a little while and I had a lot of family trauma and drama going on so I had to step back and I really didn't list much in those three months so I won't hit the $8,000 mark this year, but hopefully next year I will. And we've still got till, let's see, we've got two more months to go. So who knows what will happen between now and, and Christmas. So and maybe two of the best months of the year. October has been yeah. unprecedented for me. I'm just, I don't know what happened. It's just all of a sudden everything is selling and I've transitioned to the higher dollar items, which I've been trying to do for two years now. And it looks like that's finally sticking. So, yes. um, and sometimes you just can't explain why sales are good or why they're slow. You, there's just too many factors to identify, but um, so just, you keep going and eBay is, is something you can come and go from. Yeah. That's what I like about it is you can always hit pause. And if you need personal time, you can just step back. Like I see so many women that I went to high school with that they're working with these MLM companies, which I hate. Oh my goodness. That's a pet peeve of mine. In my opinion, 
MLM companies are like a legal form of slavery because they sell these products for these companies and they may be only getting like 20% of whatever the item sells for. And they're basically working for free. And I just, I, I can't stand it. So I like that I can set my own hours. I can set my own prices on items. I don't have to get on Facebook and post these cheesy videos and monologues that they script for you. You can just, you don't have to spam people. You like, on my fa my Facebook friends, they don't know I do this. Only my close family knows that I do this. And I like to keep it that way. So. <laughs> Cause you don't want to end up selling everybody else's stuff, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so um, back to the MLM, you're exactly right. Um, only a certain tiny percentage will get to the top. And that's the lure is to get them in and, oh, you're gonna have all these people working under you. Well, only a small percentage can be the queen bee. You can't have thousands and thousands of queen bees. You only, you only get one. And they do provide these protocols for social media. And it's so obvious what they're doing. It's, um, I had a friend that she did lose some weight doing one of these things. I forget what it was. And so she wanted to get into selling it. And so she picked my brain uh, for how to do it. But she, she told me, she showed me the stuff. It was, you know, one success story where you have the before and after picture, one motivational quote, and then one uh, recipe every single day. And, it, and you look at people in these MLMs and that's exactly what they're doing. They don't, and do they not realize how annoying that is? Oh, I, I just hide them. You know, I, I don't want to see that every single day. And with eBay, it's, the platform is there. Millions of buyers are already on it. You don't have to drive any traffic there. You just have to figure out what people want and provide it. You don't have to invite people to parties. You don't have to pressure your friends. Uh, that pampered chef stuff. Oh God, so many friends have done that. And um, I just say, I don't cook. I, I assemble and reheat. So it's like soup and sandwich. I'm a single person. I don't have to cook anymore. <laughs> I don't blame you a bit. So, you know, the pampered chef stuff is actually good to resell if you can find the old stuff in the thrift store. But um, I think people are just sick of all this selling, this direct selling. It just, I am not cut out for that. It's nauseating. I just, I would rather just see what people want and like and what sells for me, like the cashmere sweaters that I love working with. I just, oh, I love them. I just love finding them and touching them. And I love to sell those and people buy them. So I don't have to talk anybody into it. And, oh, you know, this is why you should buy this cashmere sweater. And this is going to look great on you. And, oh, it matches your eyes and blah, blah, blah. You know, you just find stuff people like and put it in your store. And there you go. Yep. Yeah. And back to the to MLM um, thing when, you know, I've been teaching eBay for a long time because obviously I'm passionate about it and I see people succeed and it's just, I can't be everywhere in the world to get all this stuff to sell. So why not help other people? But um, my motto was, you know, I'm not here to convince you. You have to already get it and then mm -hmm. I can help you. But that's not so with an MLM, you know, you've got to learn the scripts and learn the products and do all the live streams on Facebook. They require that you yep. put on those lives. You have to, and if you're not a, a person that, you know, if you're more introverted or you don't want to be on camera, like you, that's not going to work for you with eBay. You can just be this invisible picker <laughs> yep. and sell stuff. <laughs> um, anyway, sorry about the rant. But oh, okay. um, <laughs> how I many could talk about that all day? <laughs> yeah, I know we get it, right? You're on board with that. <laughs> um, you just gotta love them, but there's boundaries. I don't want to buy your yep. stuff. Um, so, how many things do you have in your store? I currently have 315. Um, I used to keep around 450. But in July, I did a purge. I had a yard sale and whatever didn't sell, I took to Goodwill and hauled off. It was just slow moving items, but I'm pretty comfortable being around 300 items. And don't you wonder 
what happens with the stuff that didn't work for you that you purged? Because I do that too. Like, oh, I've had this for a year and a half. No offers, no interest, no questions. I wouldn't buy it now. It, it's going back. Well, I take it to a thrift store I don't go to, so I don't have to see it again. Um, <laughs> but it's like, I wonder who's going to buy this and if they'll be able to sell it. So it's, we're all just passing our stuff around. <laughs> yeah. And I want to tell people, you know, just because you aren't good at selling a certain item, don't let that discourage you. Like, I know you're really good at selling clothing, but I'm so, so with it. Like in the last three months, I've only sold 11 clothing items. So, you know, everybody has their strong suits and just because that certain category isn't the right fit for you doesn't mean that it's a total waste of time for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I like that you encourage that. Well, and I think it's, it's a few factors. First of all, I think there is something in the eBay algorithm that recognizes what sells in your store. So back to cashmere for me, I have been selling that on eBay since day one. And so the algorithm knows that's a good seller in my store. I always have it. I sell it every week globally. So it learns what works for you because obviously eBay wants sales because they want their fees and they want you to keep doing it. So um, sometimes I'll, I'll start with a new product line that I've never sold before, like the leather planners. I started picking those up, I don't know, a couple of years ago. Now that's a consistent thing for me. And sometimes I'll sell them right after they're listed, even though there's plenty of that exact same thing. And some people say, oh, well, you have a YouTube channel and you have all this stuff and it's all your viewers buying your items. I don't think so. Yes, some do. And I really appreciate that. I recognize their names, but I've been doing this. Let's see, we're going into my 19th year. Um, and I haven't had that audience the whole time, you know, that's, that's somebody just making an excuse like, oh, I could never do this because you have to have this YouTube audience. You have a podcast, all this stuff you do. And that's not true at all. There's plenty of people that look at KC and Brian and, uh, Ginger Lampright and all those people that post every single week. They don't have any of that. Yeah. They're just hard workers and they're good pickers. Absolutely. So, and I would love after this whole pandemic is over, whenever that may be, whether it's like two years from now, if we could have like a eBay sellers convention in Atlanta, I would totally come to that. I would love to meet everybody. I know everybody lives all over the country. I'm in Tennessee. So Atlanta's about a four hour, four to five hour drive, but oh, I would just love to meet them in person and like pick their brains. So I would, I would be on board with that, but I don't want to plan it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't blame you. That, that is a lot that of work. Back in 2017, um, that was one thing I hadn't done was travel and, and do these in-person um, seminars, like a <laughs> workshop. And I did also start a meetup group in Atlanta. And it was just, it just took me away from what I'm good at and, you know, planning travel and all the reserving the space and figuring out the food. That was the hardest part of having an all day event is you yeah. have to figure out the food because all these different dietary requirements. And I just was like, one day I was just having a meltdown. I was like, I got all the stuff to list. I need to make a video, blah, 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 all these things. And I'm sitting here trying to figure out what people are going to eat at this workshop <laughs> so, and then the, the hotel got it wrong and oh, it was no. just, you know and the gluten-free person didn't have anything to eat and it was just ah, it was not what I'm good at so yeah. I'll put this out there if somebody is an event planner and they want to plan the whole thing and collect the money and do all that stuff I'll I'll go I just don't want to plan it and and like meet up you have to pay a fee to even have the meetup, even if you don't have any of the meetings. And then people would waffle on if they were going to come or not. So you didn't know how many you were going to have. And it was just, I don't know how event planners do it because it was very stressful because you, it's so unpredictable, you know, like kind of like in your business, you know, how big of a crowd are you going to have and how 
how long are they going to stay? And, you know, it's, it's very stressful. So. Well, maybe I'll just dream about it in my mind. <laughs> no, maybe someone will hear this podcast and they will say, hey, I have this and we can do it here and they'll make it happen. So we're, we're putting it out to the universe. This is what we want. And we don't have to worry about the how. We just worry about the what. And the how will figure itself out. There we go. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I don't think, what were we talking about? Oh, variables in your eBay store. Yep. So yeah, just keep trying new things. Some things are going to work. Some things aren't. And some things are going to surprise you. Absolutely. You know what surprised me is these accessories, hats and gloves. I found a pair of gloves last weekend, just Somebody just threw on top of one of those baskets at the end of the aisle at Goodwill. It was mixed in with children's socks and just, I don't know. And it was a leather, vintage, men's size, extra large, lined with rabbit fur. This is made in Philippines. You could tell they were vintage and it was a big size and they were $3. And I was like, oh, these look nice. So I got them. They sold in two days for $62. Wow. And they're just gloves. I mean, they're leather and they're rabbit lined, which I'm allergic to rabbit. So I don't even know why I brought that home, but I'm glad they're gone. <laughs> I put it in plastic so it wouldn't bother me. But um, so, and then hats, just beanie type hats, uh, baseball caps, anything with something weird or different on it. I was very surprised at how well those sell. So that fits into my small, doesn't take up much space. But two years ago, I never thought I could make this much money selling accessories, belts and wallets and glasses and gloves and hats. And I've seen some beautiful scarves on the Money Making Mondays that are selling for over $100 because they're vintage or they're just cool looking. Um, so there's a lot of money in those items that kind of hiding in plain sight like it's it's not the Levi's big e trucker jacket but it's all these little things that add up oh so. yeah and those little bitty sales like the accessories the way I look at it if I sell something for 25 bucks well that covers my eBay store fee for the month mm -hmm. you know those little sales do add up now I I typically like to make $20 or more profit on an item. And I'm a little, I'm a tightwad. My husband laughs and makes fun of me because I'm such a penny pincher. But my little rule is if I spend $10 or more on an item, I want to sell it for a hundred bucks or more. So that's my little rule. That's not, that's not, you know, written in stone. Don't take that, you know, to heart. That doesn't have to be anybody else's rule, but I just, I, I have a little budget to every week. I set aside $25 a week as my eBay budget. I really don't spend a whole lot of money on inventory. Um, like, like this week, I, I overshot my budget a hair and spent $30. But then there's some weeks where I only spend 15 or 20. So it, it evens out pretty well. And so if great. you're putting, say, $100 a month into your inventory, but you are profiting at what 500 to a thousand a month about 600 on average so where else can you get that kind of return on investment oh it's way better than the stock market with such low risk that's yes. the key is yeah you could go sell drugs on the street and make more but that's illegal that's a little high risk I'll just go up here to the goodwill and gamble a little bit on a dollar here and three dollars there and if it doesn't work, like you said, you just redonate it. Yeah. So the risk is very low, but the return can be very high. Like, you know, the five dollar item you sell for a hundred. Yeah. So, do you have any final words for sellers out there? Um, I guess it would be to just be patient with things. I know it can be kind of discouraging at times looking at the. Um, the Money Making Monday thread. I had a period for a while where I was comparing myself to other sellers and it kind of got me down and out. And I really recommend to people don't compare yourself to other sellers because 
we can't all have a supersized sale every single week. And if you stick with it long enough, you're going to learn and grow over time and get more refined with your picking and nail those keywords and stuff. But limit your mindset to using that thread as a learning tool instead of a comparison tool. Right, exactly. And some of the ones, the heavy hitters, they're on there every week with really expensive items. I don't know how much inventory they have, how much money they have tied up in their inventory. Um, Casey did admit that he has probably a thousand unlisted items. So it's, it's all about how you are doing your business. Mm -hmm. So you're not going out there, you're not doing this full time and you're not going out there every single day, gathering up things and buying things that that may not be listed for a while. So it, just do better than you did last month or yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, only look at your progress. And it's great that you keep your numbers because you can see that over time. You can look back a year ago and say, wow, I have really improved. Or, oh, I'm glad I'm not selling those things anymore because they didn't mm -hmm. really make me any money. So you, you keep refining and making better decisions and a year from now, we, maybe we should do a follow-up and see where you are. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. I've enjoyed talking with you. And thank you so much for having me on here. This has been like a really big confidence boost for me. Like I said earlier, about July to September, I was going through a lot of personal family stuff. And I honestly, at one point, almost considered quit selling on eBay. Like I was going through some depression and stuff like that. And when you sent me a message asking me to be on here, it just, it get, I felt like I had a purpose again and that I wasn't doing this for nothing. And I turned to my husband when you sent me the message and I was like, babe, you're not going to believe it. The eBay lady wants me to be on her podcast. He doesn't know your name. He's a man. He doesn't keep up with that stuff. Right, but, right. Um, but it was such a good confidence boost. And thank you so much for having me here. It's, I've enjoyed it immensely. Oh, well, I'm so glad I could help. And I just, I keep watching and your name just kept popping up. Savannah Boone, Savannah Boone. And I was like, what? <laughs> what's her story? What's she up to? So you obviously have a very good eye and you're improving all the time. So I tell people, don't ever say you're gonna quit eBay. You can you know, take a break or take a month off or put it on the back burner because what I'm seeing is during COVID, a lot of people did quit selling because mm -hmm. they couldn't get inventory or whatever issues. Some people in healthcare actually had more opportunities to, you know, get more hours and, and they, everything changed for a lot of people. So mm -hmm. now they're starting to come back. Yeah, And I also see people that uh, I'm just going to quit. I'm frustrated. And they go away. And then a year or two later, they're back. They, I miss it. I want to do it again. So it, it's something that can just be there for you all the time, whenever you want to do it, however much you want to do it. And you can come and go from it. That's, that's the beauty of it. You can't do that with an in-person job. You have to commit. But with eBay, you just fit it in. Absolutely. Well, thanks again for coming on. And um, we will see you on Facebook on the Money Making Mondays. I can't wait to see what else you sell. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Bye. Bye. Thanks again, Savannah, for being brave enough to come on to my podcast. I have many more guests lined up. In fact, this podcast is transitioning to only guests <laughs> and not me rambling on about things. So I've gotten a lot of great feedback from listeners that they really enjoy meeting other sellers through the podcast, hearing their stories, and eBay can be kind of isolating. So it's fun to listen to what other people do so that you can connect better to people on social media and know their backstory. Thanks again for listening. And as always, have a profitable and productive and fun 
today on eBay. Talk to you next week. Bye.